Oh, hello. So, uh, since there's nothing going on today, and it was just a really slow sort of day around the office, uh, I was reading some books and uh, working on the T-Rex reading list. So, given that 2021 has started and all of the weirdness of 2020 is completely over and never to be heard of again, and 2021 is upon us and it's just all going to be good and peaceful and orderly and predictable and all of that good stuff, um, yeah, I thought you might want to work on some of your New Year's resolutions, which would include reading books about the Second Amendment. Actually, I've been working on this for a little while because we have had a whole bunch of folks uh, asking about a, a T-Rex reading list or suggestions on where they could go to get some more research on the Second Amendment. So, uh, one of the things that I have been going through is this stack of Second Amendment books, trying to find the perfect... Uh, all in one book that you read and you get yourself uh, everything that you need to know about the Second Amendment. And uh, I'm going to mention just, you know, has nothing to do with the events of, of, of today. I'm just saying I've been working on this for a while and talking about violent overthrows of government and people holding tyrannical governments in check and the rules and responsibilities of government. Uh, these are really important things to know about in 2021 because now that things are back to normal, we'll have time to read about this stuff. Uh, which will be super nice. So I want to start out with, with uh, the Second Amendment books because that's what you guys have been asking the most about. And the bad news is there is no one perfect book. There's a bunch of books that cover specific types of topics, but uh, I, I do have some favorites. And I am going to post uh, links or at least the names and authors of all of these books in the show notes uh, or the description of the video and then the show notes of the podcast because T-Rex Talk is also a, a podcast. Um, that you can find on your podcasty stuff. So a bunch of people uh, suggesting that I recommend David McCullough's 1776, which I am going to recommend in the history section. And uh, we are we do have a history section on the reading list because um, it's very difficult to talk about the Second Amendment just in a vacuum. Uh, it's really easy to talk about the Second Amendment in and around the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights because that's when most of the discussion happened, but there's so much stuff that happened prior to it, and there's so much stuff that has happened legally in America after it. Uh, nothing today, of course, nothing related to the Second Amendment is happening on January 6th, but, you know, for the last uh, hundreds of years, uh, we've, you know, been various things developed related to the Second Amendment. So I want to shout out uh, this first book here. This is probably your best starting point, that every man be armed, um, by Stephen Hallbrook. And this book starts prior to uh, America being founded, and it talks about a bunch of the different ideas that have floated around throughout civilization about private ownership of weapons prior to the founding of the United States, prior to uh, the American Revolutionary War. And then it talks about a bunch of stuff that has happened in America with the Second Amendment, stuff that happened uh, during and around the Civil War and after the Civil War and 14th Amendment and stuff like that. Supreme Court uh, stuff that has come out. And it's a very scholarly book with lots of uh, useful endnotes if you want to continue your study. So, so this is probably the best book. Um, it's extremely readable and it's only uh, 240 pages for really getting a good grasp of a basic history of the Second Amendment, Second Amendment and some of the discussion about the Second Amendment in a legal sense um, over the course of the United States. Now, he also has, uh, Stephen Holbrook has another book called The Founder's Second Amendment. This is a great reference book because it covers, uh, it's a much longer book, it's about 400 pages. It covers a ton of discussion around the founding of the United States the ratification of the Constitution, implementation of the Bill of Rights, discussion between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and basically it is all of the uh, speeches and correspondence of the founders as they talked about stuff related to Second Amendment and militia things. So this is a great reference work uh, when you want to find out what people in New Jersey, what, what reps in New Jersey were saying about private ownership of weapons and what they were arguing for or against when they were discussing their own militia when they were discussing various parts of um, what should be inside of the Bill of Rights, what the different militia acts should mean. 
uh, it's all divided up and, and easy to find that stuff. So this is a great reference work. Um, if what you want is not an overview, but really specific what certain people said and quotes from people about the Second amendment -y stuff. Um, so, so Stephen Halbrook is my favorite author on this topic so far. I have found uh, a bunch of guys who touch on the issue really well, but, but he is very solid. There's also a bunch of people who write about this stuff from perspectives that I don't think are helpful or necessarily true. And I'm gonna to get to that a little bit later. I'm not recommending any of those books. None of them are here on the table, but I'll kind of explain why um, in, in a bit. Also, I'm pointing out uh, earlier on that I'm not paying a whole lot of attention to the chat because I've got a lot of books on the table here. Although we're making pretty good time. We've gotten through one author and we're six minutes in. But you guys are uh, talking about uh, all kinds of stuff in the chat. I'm probably not going to have a chance to really answer questions because they're being drowned out by conversations about things that, from what I can tell on the chat, is stuff that happened in the War of 1812. So uh, you guys keep talking about the War of 1812. I'm going to be talking about 1776 um, and other stuff. Uh, another good book, this is actually probably even a more entry-level book than uh, May That Every Man Be Armed. Um, this is a book by an author named John Payne who is... Um, Somebody that I don't know, but he knows us because he mentions T-Rex arms in the back of the book. Um, but this is a book which is called the Second Amendment Manifesto, What Every American Should Know About Their Constitutional Right to Own Guns. I should have done a better job of writing all of this in my notes. Um, this is a very entry-level book, uh, but it does a great job of providing, I, I say entry-level in a good way, it does a great job of providing an overview of weapon rights. Um, the second chapter is the 2,000-year history of the right to bear arms in 15 minutes. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite good. Um, I will say, I think that he's a little too hard on Cromwell because he's primarily looking at superficial stuff that happened in 1651. Uh, we can talk about Cromwell more later. I also think that a lot of uh, historians get the new model army wrong. I believe that it's actually more of a militia than a standing army. Uh, but I wanna say kudos to John Payne for recognizing that the glorious revolution of 1688 was a major win for freedom and a major win for, for weapon rights. So I really like his take on a lot of these, these things that are in here and I really encourage that this is out there. And this is a super easy, almost beginner's book because the, uh, the last half of the book is actually equipment that you should buy. So it, it's trying to cover all the bases, which means that it ends up being not incredibly deep in any one area, but it goes from everything through what you should think about the Second Amendment, where it came from, all the way through to what equipment you should have and why and which websites to go and get it from. And he recommends uh, the T-Rex sling. I mean, the Edgar Sherman sling is better, according to him. Um, I think I agree with that. He also mentions that we make holsters. Uh, he doesn't mention that we make plate carriers, which helps me know when this book was written. But because it feels like it's print on demand, uh, he could update it. So I, I will say the John Payne book, Second Amendment Manifesto, is quite good. Um, then there's another book here that uh, I'm, I'm impressed by, but I found a little bit <laughs> harder to read because it was longer. Um, it's called De Infringe, and this is written by Men of Arms. Uh, a pseudonym, but this is somebody uh, on social media that we don't know who it is. And this is a similar, um, similar all-in-one book that should cover a whole lot of stuff. This is written in a much more conversational way and covers a lot of online uh, arguments that you will run into and the answers for some of those things. So that is, um, if, if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for all of the all of the ramifications of gun control and conversations about Waco and stuff like that. It is, it is more in this book. This book is more like, I don't even know if this is the right, this, this sounds, <laughs> this sounds non-complimentary. This book is almost like an internet argument. Uh, but I mean that in a good way. This internet is like a conversation and the points answering the questions that will come up in the conversation about Second Amendment are in here in a very conversational way. And to be honest, I have only skimmed this book. Uh, I've read the stuff that I have 
a decent understanding of so I can see if the sources are good and then I skimmed through the rest so that I know sort of what the other topics are inside of here. Um, I think that this is this is a good book. I would I believe that I would ask folks to start with the Second Amendment Manifesto. I think that that makes a bit more sense um, for an introductory book. Um, but if you are, if you're not so much of a reader and you want something that is a little more conversational and a little bit more internet flavored, uh, Dean Fringe is good. Um, and Men of Arms, uh, if you would like some comments, private comments on the typesetting, that was another thing that bugged me a little bit about the book. You shouldn't necessarily listen to my criticisms entirely because as a graphic designer, I'm very picky about book typesetting and probably pickier than I should be. But uh, that's also, I believe, a print-on-demand book where if you wanted better typesetting in the way that you handle your endnotes, uh, let me know because I have strong opinions about how endnotes should be formatted. Um, and speaking of strong opinions, um, I have another book here called Aiming for Liberty by David Koppel. And this is a book that uh, I recommend under certain circumstances. It depends on your level of reading comprehension and your, and your level of, of, con of uh, context. What, is, what it is that you actually know about um, this particular debate and this particular issue. And it kind, of, uh, it kind of brings into focus some of the strengths and weaknesses of all the other books. Um, these books, I believe, are all very good at covering the topics that they are trying to cover. But the issue of limited government, uh, or the issue of private weapon ownership, is tied so intrinsically to limited jurisdictions of government and whose job it is to enforce those limited jurisdictions and how government should actually be set up. And all of the histories of Western civilization, uh, as different countries and different cultures have attempted to set things up and all the different philosophers that have weighed in on this and all the different politicians who have quoted different things and what their actual influences are, it is a mammoth topic to cover. And so the fact that none of these books cover the entirety um, of that discussion is not surprising. It's also not a failing. But I want to get back to um, David Koppel's book. So David Koppel is uh, a gun rights attorney. He made a bunch of the arguments at the DC versus Heller case. I believe he was the guy who was most quoted by uh, the justices who wrote the actual decision. So David Koppel is a guy who's been in the Second Amendment fight for a while. And this is a book that is, it's almost less of a book and more of a collection of articles. And some articles are, are better than others. So for example, he has an, uh, a chapter in here called Religious Perspectives on Freedom from the Ancient World, where he goes through uh, ancient Israel in the Old Testament and the way that their militia was set up and the limitations that were placed upon the king and the history that is there. And that is a fantastic chapter. He even goes into, and I think this is very important, he even goes into uh, the founders of the United States that quoted from the Old Testament and wanted to pull some of these ideas into the founding of our own country. Um, and the pastors that were preaching at the time from the Old Testament on these issues of limited government. Um, he covers that very well. Now, what he does not do, uh, interestingly, uh, is that he does not cover all of the arguments that some of those same pastors were making on that same issue uh, from the New Testament. And I think that there are fantastic ways in which the Old Testament and the New Testament support each other in the responsibilities of individuals and citizens of nations. Um, the institutions of family, church, and state, and the limited jurisdictions that each of those have, and the amount and level of um, teaching and writing that was being done at that time on why government must be limited and how government must be limited is extremely important. And he actually does a better job of touching on that than any of the other authors in, in this particular stack, except for Holbrook. I think Holbrook does a pretty good job of that in this book, just quoting the founders in the uh, Founders Second Amendment book. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a point that I want, I want to get onto uh, in, in just a second. But then there's uh, another chapter, which is Religious Perspectives on Freedom from the West. And that's not as good a chapter because he chooses what I think are uh, more of the weird outliers of Western civilization and not actually kind of the fundamental structural arguments uh, and cases and, and trends of Western civilization on this particular issue. Like, 
Um, he picked some weird philosophers or some weird uh, proto-transcendentalists from New England that were teaching on this issue when those guys were there and influential to some level, but there were also tons of other denominations who were doing serious, heavy-duty, centuries-long work on this issue, and those are the churches that most of the founders were going to. And so, uh, yes, talking about Mayhew makes sense, but talking about Mayhew in uh, such an exclusive way is a little odd. So I would say this is a very interesting and helpful book. He has articles, uh, or he has chapters in this book that, again, feel like articles, which um, are fascinating. Like, what gun freedoms look like inside of other countries and the results thereof, like stuff that's happening in Uganda right now, stuff that was happening in Sudan uh, at the time that the book was written, which was right before the secession of South Sudan and uh, the genocide that was happening there at the time. So there's a bunch of stuff that is in here <clears throat> that um, is really interesting, fascinating stuff that's not in other books on the Second Amendment, but is directly related. So I would say this is a book that is absolutely worth reading, but if you have the context to make up for its, uh, its shortcomings. So that is, um, yeah, so that is a, a, a recommendation. All of these books get a recommendation, but none of these books are a read this book, nothing else is required. Then you will know everything that you need to know to navigate the world that you live in beginning on uh, January 6th of 2021, the year that the world went back to normal and nobody had anything else to worry about. That's, that's what historians are, are absolutely going to write when they write the history books about 2021. That's going to be the title of all the books. Um, yes, so uh, there's a bunch of people in the chat still talking about the War of 1812, I'm assuming. Uh, a bunch of people wondering why I'm not talking about the events of today. Well, obviously, it's 2021. Everything's back to normal. What could possibly be talked about uh, when it comes to current events. But also because um, we are live streaming this on YouTube. YouTube has political opinions and agendas and requirements for certain live streams. And I would like this one to stay up. So I'm not going to talk about the events of today, but if you're paying attention, you will realize that I'm talking about events of the past that are remarkably similar to the events of today. And the issues that our forefathers were dealing with when they talked about limiting the scope of government uh, is incredibly important, not just today, but all the time, because people don't actually change. People are corrupt and evil, and so that's why government is needed uh, to deal with lawbreakers. But government has to be limited as well, because it's going to be made up of corrupt, evil people also, because that's just how people work. And people don't change and haven't changed. And so these issues that we are discussing are timeless, and history has a lot that, um, that we can learn from. Uh, T-Rex, are you worried about our Second Amendment in the future? Oh, absolutely. There is something that I call... Um, well, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use some of the words that I like on YouTube anymore. But let's just call it moral entropy. Uh, you know, the second law of thermodynamics says that we basically are losing... Uh, <laughs> you have to work really hard to overcome entropy. There's something called moral entropy, uh, where basically you have to fight very hard to be moving in the right direction. And cultures have to do this as well. If you are not moving in the right direction and you think you're just coasting, you're actually going downstream the tendency of people and the tendency of governments is in the wrong direction and it takes a lot of work to go the other way. It requires people to be willing to uh, work and sacrifice for freedom, uh, but also to have really good definitions of what that work needs to look like, what sacrifices are acceptable, and what freedom even is, which is the whole point of the T-Rex Arms reading list. Um, that's why we're talking about this today and not some other time. Uh, we're talking about this today because um, because it's 2021 and you guys uh, have New Year's resolutions that you need to keep that involve reading more books. That's why we're talking about it today. No, no other reason at all. Uh, I actually feel like with all these book recommendations, I should be wearing my tweed jacket and smoking my pipe. So before I move on to the other topic, there is a area, and I kind of touched on this before, where all books that are on the Second Amendment 
kind of miss something. All of these books that I have mentioned, and uh, also the worst Second Amendment books that I haven't mentioned, they miss, I think, a very important bit of context. And I mentioned it a little bit with this, uh, this book of David Koppel's. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I should have done a little bit more research, but I wasn't actually planning on giving this particular talk today. Um, although I don't know why I wasn't, because obviously it's 2021, the year of everything being back to normal and everybody having time to read books. Um, the issue is uh, one of context. Modern historians have perpetuated the idea that the American founders were far more motivated by Greek and Roman philosophy than by their Christian heritage. That's been pretty much accepted throughout the 20th century. Uh, the efforts to kind of redefine uh, the early 1700s and late 1600s is something that happened, oh, probably actually began pretty heavily uh, in public schools in the mid to late 1800s. But by the 20th century, everybody was kind of on board with this idea that the American founders were deists, they didn't really go to church all that much. They didn't really learn anything from the Bible. Uh, what they loved was the Roman books that they read in their, um, their good old classical education days and uh, modern uh, humanistic enlightenment philosophers. That's an idea that has become basically entrenched in the way that um, basically anybody thinks about the founders. And if you read all of the quotations and all the information that is in this book by Stephen Halbrook, you kind of question that idea. Uh, and Stephen Halbrook does, I think, the best job at not just assuming that they paid a lot more attention to Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato than any of uh, the Bible verses that they were quoting. I think he does the best job at not falling into that trap. But that is a trap that is pretty universal in the 20th century and the 21st century. And I think that that causes people to miss a lot of stuff as they talk about the Second Amendment. There's this idea that the Second Amendment comes out of classical thinking, uh, medieval scholasticism, and not out of a scriptural tradition, or that it comes out of the um, secular enlightenment that was basically happening at the same time, but in a different continent by people who were diametrically opposed to what the founders were trying to do. So it's sort of problematic to actually um, make this claim. I've, I've talked to people directly who are, uh, I've had direct conversation with people who have made the case that, oh, no, no, the ideas that you're talking about did not come out of the Bible. They came out of um, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, or they came out of Plato's Republic. That's, that is where the founders got all of their ideas. That is where the founders got the idea of national, uh, natural law. That's where they got the idea of limited government. It's like, dude, have you ever read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan? It is not about limiting government. It is about removing as many limits of government as possible so that government can be as all-encompassing a sovereign as possible so that people can't get away with anything at all. There is no way that the American founders read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan and said, this guy has some fantastic ideas. Let's have, um, let's have the right to keep and bear arms. Let's have the right of free speech. Let's have the right of a free press. Because that is exactly the opposite of what David Hobbes wanted. They were getting the ideas for free speech, um, private property, and the ability to keep and bear arms so that the government could be resisted from somewhere else. There was not David Hobbes. There are other Enlightenment thinkers who were less statist than David Hobbes, but they were getting that idea from somewhere else. And they were not getting that idea from Plato's Republic either. Um, Plato also wanted a very large, uh, tyrannical, centralized government to keep an eye on people and to educate people so that people's problems could be solved by a giant top-down government, um, which is the exact opposite, again, of what our founders wanted. They wanted a very limited government. Our government was founded on the idea that government cannot be trusted. So we're going to break the power up among as many branches as possible with as many checks and balances as possible. And there's going to be a Bill of Rights that says there's a whole bunch of stuff that the government just plain old is not allowed to do. Our Bill of Rights limits the power of the government. It does not limit the power of the people. The people who wrote that document were trying to limit the power of the government. They were not trying to do what Thomas Hobbes wanted. Um, now, it is true, I don't want to argue uh, that um, our founders were not familiar with <coughs> Cicero and Plutarch and Julius Caesar and Marcus Aurelius and classical thinkers. They were, absolutely they were. They had read those books, they would read Shakespeare, they were reading stuff from Enlightenment philosophers of the time, um, for sure. 
But that doesn't mean that they were picking up on all of those ideas. That's like you guys saying, well, you're reading these books. You're on board with all these ideas. No, not necessarily. I think that each one of these books, uh, as I recommended to you, um, has a lot of meat that is good stuff. And some of these books have some meat and have some bones. And the better context you have for history and for truth, the better job you're going to do at benefiting from the meat and not choking on the bones. And I think that our founders were, for the most part, people who were very good at that. Now, obviously, I'm talking about uh, hundreds and hundreds of people over decades. So I'm not, I shouldn't generalize like that. But if I did have to generalize, I would say that the religious beliefs of the time uh, had a far greater effect on what it was that they were trying to accomplish and what it was that they were willing to fight and die for and spend their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor on than Tacitus or Aristotle's ethics and politics, which again, diametrically opposed to what they actually ended up building um, here in the United States. So uh, I, I, let me see if I can think of a, a better example of this. Um, I should stop looking at the chat because <laughs> the chat is highly distracting. You guys keep talking amongst yourself. How many people are watching, Charles? We got uh, 1,300. Okay. 1,300 people watching this instead of the nothing that, uh, that is happening today. There's, that's, that is right, isn't it, Charles? There's nothing happening today? Uh, I haven't seen a, a thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is 2020. It's the year of everything getting back to normal. Uh, sadly, the year 2020 is not the year of season three of The Mandalorian. So that's my example. So... You guys may have heard me say in previous uh, places, weapons are part of my religion, which is a quote from, I think, season one of The Mandalorian. Um, it's a cool quote from a decent show, uh, but it's actually a true statement. Weapons are a part of my religion, not in a, a ceremonial way, but using tools to fulfill the responsibilities that I believe that I have because of my religion is a very important part of my religion. And weapons are sometimes the tools that are required to fulfill those responsibilities. So when I say weapons are part of my religion, uh, I am saying something that is very true, but also a quote from a show. Now, my religion that says that about tools and weapons and personal responsibility does not come from the Mandalorian, uh, but it does come from the Bible, which I thought I had on the stack over here, but I want to hold it up. So when I say weapons are part of my religion, I'm getting that from the Bible, and then I'm quoting the Mandalorian. And I think that there's a bunch of times uh, in, in the writings of the American founders where they will quote Shakespeare, or they will quote Milton, or they will quote Caesar, or they will quote Cicero, but the underlying fundamental theological reasons for thinking the way that they think is what they've been brought up on religiously and theologically, which is far more Christianity and far less uh, Greco-Roman philosophy. Um, but they do generally talk in a lot of that lingo or quote those things in the same way that we often quote Star Wars and Marvel around the shop. Uh, Disney does not create uh, as much of my worldview as you might think based on how often I quote Star Wars. Um, so that may be part of the reason that um, <laughs> we get into some of this discussion. But I think the other big reason, uh, and this is kind of sad, is in the 21st century, church is not that big a deal, not even for Christians who go to church. For the most part, uh, we go to church, we hear a 20-minute sermon about nothing, and then Monday has come around and church time is over, Christianity time is over. It has had very little effect on the rest of our week, let alone the rest of our life. The fact that so many Christians live their lives like that today makes it easy for modern historians to assume that our founders treated Christianity the same way um, that we do. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, most of the founders went to churches where they heard a two-hour sermon that was extremely pointed and extremely scriptural. It was about something. It was about something that was incredibly important. And then it did actually change the way that they acted throughout the week, and it changed the way that they acted for the rest of their lives. And um, I do want to bring up one book. <clears throat> I'm not recommending that everybody in particular read this book, because it's another reference book. It's not a book that needs to be read. This is called Meet the Puritans. It's a book by Dr. Beakey. And all it is, <laughs> all it is, is uh, 
miniature biographies of many of the Puritans, certainly not all, and then uh, a, um, a short description of some of the books, again, not all, that they had written. So this is a 800-something page book. Uh, each of these pages is a Puritan or two, and then a small bibliography of stuff that they wrote. So we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people writing thousands and thousands of books in just one language, in just one uh, faction of Christianity, in a pretty short amount of time. And most of these guys were the ones who either moved to the American colonies because they were being forced out uh, of England, or had written the books um, and, and preached uh, in the generation prior to that, or were living in the United States in the generation after that. So these guys are an incredibly influential group of men that produced an incredibly large amount of material on the very topics that we are talking about in these books. The amount of material that these guys wrote on the role of government and the role of the church and the limited jurisdictions of each is phenomenal. And when you go back and you read the stuff in the founders, you will see them uh, quoting books like Lex Rex or Aaron's Rod Blossoming or uh, Vindicii Contra Tyrannus, stuff that was being written in the 15 and 1600s on this very topic by Puritans and Presbyterians, not humanistic political philosophers. So, when books completely miss that angle, I think they're missing something that is really important. And Stephen Holbrook does a good job of not missing that, even though he doesn't particularly touch on it. And uh, David Koppel, I want to give kudos because he actually mentions Lex Rex. Um, Lex Rex, very important book by Samuel Rutherford, um, written around 1640. A uh, little bit of trivia. Uh, the T-Rex that is in the T-Rex Arms logo technically named Lex after the book Lex Rex, which means the law is king. Uh, the whole purpose of the book, written by Samuel Rutherford, says the law is king, and it is actually sovereign over the monarch. The king of a country is under the law. That's the whole purpose of the book. It's a book that gets quoted a lot as people resist tyranny, um, not just in the United States, but other places. And... Um, a number of these Second Amendment books do talk about prior um, resistances of governments, um, but I think that some of those are worth studying on their own. So I've got a couple of other book recommendations uh, for those. Um, well, okay, so, so another thing that I was going to say, I stacked these books in roughly the order that I thought I wanted to talk about these. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, uh, I see some guys quoting Thomas Paine in there. Oh, I, I'm glad you guys brought up Thomas Paine because Thomas Paine uh, both, well, I think he illustrates my point really well. Here's a quote from Thomas Paine. Thank you, James George, for boasting this. The cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. Where, some say, is the king of America, I will tell you, friend, he reigns above. And Thomas Paine wrote that um, February 14, 1776. So Thomas Paine is a guy... Um, who does not have the upbringing that most of the American founders had. He did not grow up in the United States inside of Puritan churches. He grew up in Britain. He moved to the United States very shortly before the Declaration of Independence, and he immediately loved everything that he was hearing. And he was an incredibly talented writer. And as long as he was hanging out with the American founders and those thinkers of that generation here in the United States, he's writing stuff like this quote right here. Um, he's picking up what they're putting down, and he is summarizing it, and he's using his fantastic wordplay to really sell the messages. Um, but as soon as the American uh, war for independence is over, and America has independence, he ends up going over to France to be part of the French Revolution, and he immediately stops <laughs> with a lot of the... Um, he no longer has the worldview of the American founders, he takes on to himself the more humanistic Enlightenment worldview of the French revolutionaries. He is very much blown about by every wind of doctrine that he is in, and that becomes obvious as he moves uh, from country to country. So Thomas Paine has some fantastic material when he is copy-pasting from uh, the American founders, or at least he's around them and he's breathing their air and he's hearing their thoughts and he's following along. But then when he's around somebody else, he picks up whatever it is that they're talking about. Their worldview begins to affect him. And so 
Thomas Paine is an excellent example uh, of the different worldviews that existed in America and Europe because of the way that his own uh, very unrooted, un, um, what's the right word? Just very unrooted personal uh, worldview changed based on who he was around is a pretty good indicator of the different worldviews in different places. Um, so I am sort of paying attention to the chat. Uh, examples of people resisting governments prior to the United States. There's a couple of great ones that I want to mention. One is the Magdeburg Confession that was published in 1550. Uh, and this was, uh, Charles, this is sort of your, not namesake, but Charles V um, really wanted to crack down on the church. And uh, I say this because, uh, Charles, you know what I'm referring to. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to crack down on the church. The uh, Reformation was happening. Uh, I think that's the most, probably the most influential and world-changing human event in history is the Reformation. That changed the world so much, ideologically speaking, that it cannot be overstated. But the powers that be didn't like uh, a lot of the trends that came out of it. And so uh, Charles V was really trying to crack down on the church and he actually surrounded uh, the town of Magdeburg. And the pastors of Magdeburg wrote this confession and basically said, we will not be swayed by the wealth or majesty of anyone. And they locked their doors and allowed themselves to be besieged. And this was their, their defense of what they did. So this is an incredibly important document um, that gets quoted and used a lot. And it's a formative document that changes the way that, that people think about these things. Although a lot of the stuff in here is stuff that Augustine wrote about earlier. It's, it's stuff that is in Scripture. It's stuff that's in the Old Testament. It's stuff that's in the New Testament, in Romans 13. Um, Pierre Verret I don't have an exact time of when Pierre Verret would have written this book called The Christian and the Magistrate, but it's a similar time frame. It's prior to a lot of the Enlightenment humanism stuff, but it's the exact same stuff that they get credit to, uh, get credit for. This, this idea of the government being limited and men's freedoms and rights being given by God and then delineating exactly what those are and the way that the magistrate needs to serve the people. And the magistrate actually has a job to um, interpose himself the lesser magistrate interposes himself to stop the greater magistrate. So when a king is acting in a way that is illegal, it is the lesser magistrate that must stop and arrest him. And if he won't do it, then the next lesser magistrate needs to address it, all the way down to the people if necessary. So uh, Pierre Verret was a French, uh, and this is another good example. It's not just the English Puritans that had this idea. Uh, I just happen to have this book on English Puritans because if it were all of the people of uh, similar theological ideas, uh, this book would be too big to print. But here's, here's uh, a French reformer writing on exactly the same topic and coming to very similar conclusions. And um, this may be the only uh, English translation of this book. Um, a lot of Veret's work were not translated into English until fairly recently, but uh, I have a link to this one below. Now, I will say... As good as it is to go back to uh, these source documents, they can be pretty hardcore reading at times. So uh, not only is it hard to get all of the context that you need to fully understand what's going on in these books, uh, they're just kind of hard to read on their own. So if you want to get back into um, kind of a more contemporary, easy to read book that provides the context and explanation of what's going on, I would recommend The Great Christian Revolution by Otto Scott. Um, this is a book that is mostly about the English Civil War. That is the revolution that Otto Scott calls the Great Christian Revolution. But I don't think he even gets to that until right about here. This is all context, explaining everything that happened before. And then afterwards, he talks about everything that came out of the English Revolution, everything that came out of Cromwell's New Model Army, the way that they resisted the king. Um, how that changed things in Europe, how that changed the way that everybody thought about government, um, the things that happened afterward with William and Mary, and then, of course, the things that happened afterward with George III. The ways that the Reformation influenced things like Oliver Cromwell and Parliament's revolution against the king, um, that is incredibly important history. And the way that that English Revolution uh, affected the way that 
we American colonists thought about our responsibility before George III is extremely important. When the American colonists resisted a tyrannical king, they did not think that they were doing a strange, abnormal, problematic thing. In fact, they thought that they were the ones doing one of the most British things imaginable, which is to stand up against a tyrannical monarch. This is something that people in Britain had done and had good documentation and good precedent for. And so resisting George III is no different than resisting James II or resisting Charles I. Uh, these are things that British civilians had done with force of arms in the past, and we were just doing it again in the colonies. So that is an extremely important thing to understand. So I highly recommend um, this book. Otto Scott also has some great history books on the French Revolution. Um, Robespierre specifically, he has some on uh, the collapse of South Africa. Very interesting stuff. Some of it's hard to read. It's He writes about pretty brutal history and he writes about it pretty uh, uh, pretty honestly. So just, you know, a lot of those guys didn't end well, uh, Robespierre and his buddies. So um, I, I recommend Otto Scott for, for the things that he is, is writing about. And um, when he writes about the collapse of nations, it's sort of unpleasant, but uh, possibly stuff that, that we might need to be knowing about and thinking about in the future. Not the year 2021, of course, because the year 2021 is the year that everything went back to normal. Right, Charles? Yep. Back to normal. Yes. Everything is fine. Everything is back to normal. Um, but uh, just in case things don't go quite back to normal, well, no, actually, if things go back to normal, uh, the war on guns will continue. So this is a pretty good book. This isn't necessarily a description or overview of the Second Amendment. It's by John Lott, Jr., it's called The War on Guns. It doesn't talk about why the Second Amendment exists or how it came into being or any of the history around that exactly. It talks about um, the war on the Second Amendment and it's, it's a lot of statistics and graphs and basically um, debunks a lot of the arguments that are made by uh, anti-gunners and sort of describes who has made these arguments and why and the different avenues of attack on the Second Amendment get made. So in, in the political category, <clears throat> I would say this is a useful reference work. Um, that's, it's also pretty readable, I would say. Um, but it's, it's a lot of charts and graphs and statistics um, for the folks, uh, for arguing with the folks that use charts and graphs and statistics uh, to say that um, guns are too dangerous for private citizens to own. So, uh, so yeah, so another recommendation for this one. <clears throat> um, let's see, we got about 15 minutes left. So in my political pile of books... Man, I didn't even get to anything on this side of the table. Um, I should probably recommend a P.G. O'Rourke book while we're in the political category. So this book is called Parliament of Whores. Uh, obviously, it describes, well, I guess it doesn't narrow it down much, but it does describe the American government. Uh, the subtitle is A Lone Humorist Attempt to Explain the Entire U.S. Government. And uh, he actually does a pretty good job with the title, I mean, with the, the, the whole book. Um, it's only uh, 200 pages long. Um, I'm, I'm a P.G. O'Rourke fan um, when he's talking about certain things or, or maybe, I guess, certain parts of his life. So P.G. O'Rourke is uh, a better gonzo journalist than Hunter S. Thompson in the 70s. But in the 80s, he becomes a conservative and a libertarian. And uh, he's just a fascinating writer. He is a great uh, observer and a great explainer. And uh, he's, very, he's very funny because... <laughs> He's so good at describing what's going on. So he looks at the judicial, legislative, and executive parts of the government in detail. In the same way that he had been a war re correspondent, um, he goes into the U.S. government and talks about how ridiculous things are. And uh, so this is, this is actually an extremely readable book and I think worth looking into. He also has a book on environmentalism called All the Trouble in the World. And he has one on international conflict, which is called uh, Give War a Chance. So I think that's also a, a book that is that is worth reading. They're not, um, yeah, I would say that those those three books are worth reading. Um, but I, I, I sort of skipped over the history section. There's a bunch of, of history books that you guys should read to give more context to the Second Amendment um, side of things. There's David McCullough's 1776, uh, which is excellent. 
and Paul Revere's ride by David Hackett Fisher give you a better sense of the world that these guys lived in and who they were as people. Some of the other issues that were swirling around at the time are extremely important. And then um, another historian that I appreciate quite a bit is Paul Johnson. One of the things I love about Paul Johnson is how widely uh, he has written. So he's written on, on, on almost every period of history, uh, on almost every culture, on almost every issue. Um, but I would recommend that you start with modern times. If you want to figure out how we got from 1776 to uh, July 6th, 2021, um, the book Modern Times, I think, is very helpful, talking about the, uh, the 20th century uh, and how everything kind of started to fall apart. So uh, Paul Johnson, recommend him as a historian, and then definitely recommend um, Modern Times as kind of a starting place for that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people in the chat talking about random stuff again, like normal. Um, and uh, I still have a whole bunch of books that I didn't really get a chance to talk about. But I do want to make sure that this reading list gets put on the website somewhere, probably with some better explanations of these books than I have tried to give. Um, but for now, I'm going to make sure that every book that I have talked about does end up in, a description, uh, in the description of the video so they're easier to find. And I think that these, these books are, are really important um, for understanding the times that we live in. We are definitely a, a very important, uh, we're definitely in an important time in history because every time in history is important. And the time that we live in is a product of a lot of the ideas that are represented in the books that are on the table. Uh, one of the things that I am going to put on the book list that's on the website, um, and I will probably cover in a second live stream. If there were ever a day, Charles, when nothing was happening in the news, and uh, or maybe YouTube wouldn't let us talk about certain things, that might be a day when we talk about other book recommendations. So, so on a day like January 6th, where nothing is happening in the news, we might want to talk about books about limiting government, books about why government needs to have limited jurisdictions, ways in which people need their firearms, so that they can protect their freedoms. Like that's a great thing to talk about on a day when nothing is happening, obviously. Um, but there might also be days in which we want to talk about basic economics, uh, how to build stuff when you don't have any electricity, how to build stuff when you do have electricity, how to build countries from scratch. Um, yeah, there might be days in future live streams where we want to talk about those books. Uh, but one of the books that I do think that I want to talk about, uh, I would like to have a rogues gallery of books. I would like to have books like some of the Saul Alinsky books. I think I'd like to have uh, Machiavelli's The Prince, The Communist Manifesto, stuff like that. Because I, I also think that it's important that we know what the enemy is talking about. We know what the opposition is saying. We're familiar with the ways that they work. Um, and that provides a lot of good context. So when you're reading modern contemporary historical books, you have some historical context for what the contemporary historians are saying. And you can say, well, you're, you're kind of missing the point there. Like all of your talk about these fancy new enlightenment philosophers, that's kind of the froth on top of the deeper, richer stuff that, that actually this culture is built upon, or this country is built upon, or even some of those philosophers are standing on the shoulders of uh, decades of great Christian thinkers, and they're experimenting with weird ideas while still standing on the shoulders of Christian civilization and the ideas of Christendom that have come out of Scripture. They want to do not Scripture, but they still want the same rights and the same individual values that only the Bible provides for. So that is something that the more context you have, the better you're going to be able to understand that. And that requires uh, context from history, but also context for what are the prevailing ideas of the day, where are they coming from. And uh, just, you know, just to throw out, I don't know, January 6th as an example, like there's a whole bunch of people saying random stuff. Uh, just because they're holding an American flag might not mean they're on your side. They might also have like a hammer and sickle tattoo. That might mean something. And then you could like figure out what ideology that represents. And that would help you like make sense of the situation. Just pulling an idea out of a hat. A hat that looks like the top of a buffalo's head with horns. Just, just an idea. Just random thoughts, Charles. <laughs> uh, someone suggests uh, fantasy books, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I have some fictional books that I think everybody should read. Um, 
We'll talk about those more in a future uh, live stream probably, but Robinson Crusoe, very important. Animal Farm, 1984. Not relevant today, obviously, but like for literature purposes, probably worth knowing about. Uh, Dune, I think that's probably worth reading. Screw Tape Letters, Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I could do a whole hour on Lord of the Rings, uh, lessons to take away from Lord of the Rings. Right now, most of them, I believe, come from the scouring of the Shire part. But uh, yeah, that'll be, that'll be a future, future live stream someday. So, someday when we're not uh, allowed, uh, I mean, there's nothing to talk about. We'll talk about Lord of the Rings and the scouring of the Shire. Um, I even want to recommend some children's books um, because you might have kids that you're training up or uh, nieces and nephews that you want to give presents to, or maybe you're just very young viewer. Um, but uh, I, I have some children's books that I think are really helpful for building a solid, well-rounded worldview. Uh, or at the very least, they might, uh, they might introduce some ideas that, uh, that explain why I like some of these books. Um, so that is something that uh, is extremely, um, yeah, that'll, that'll be on the, the trxarms.com book list. And maybe we'll get to it in a future, a future live stream. If, if there were ever a day when there was nothing to talk about, like January 6th. Um, actually, no, no, 2021 is the year when everything gets back to normal. So we should have lots of days where there's nothing to talk about, uh, nothing that we're allowed to talk about. Um, I also was thinking, Charles, about having, in addition to the rogues gallery of stuff like uh, Communist Manifesto, which is bad, but stuff that you should know, uh, I almost want to put together a blacklist of stuff that is bad, but so bad you shouldn't even read it, like hardcore heretical stuff. Yeah. Uh, that would be kind of interesting, except for the fact that maybe, maybe people would read it just out of curiosity and... I don't know, do more harm than good. Uh, that's kind of what the stuff on the blacklist would be. Um, actually, everything that I would put on the blacklist are, are contemporary Christian authors at this point. <laughs> uh, and speaking of Christian authors, uh, we could get into a theology and philosophy section because I think that is extremely important. Um, and that is what a lot of these historical books are is theology and philosophy. And those are, are very important concepts that we, we cannot leave behind. And uh, in, in the chat, there's always folks who say, stop talking about the Bible, just talk about gun rights. And I, I hope that you guys can see and understand. The only reason that I care about gun rights is because I believe that the right to life is a right that is given by God. All of my understanding and all of my uh, passion for this particular issue or these particular topics or for, or for freedom or for civilization really come out of the Bible. So asking me to not talk about the Bible and only talk about the ideas that I have that have come from the Bible is kind of pointless and, and uh, counterproductive. Um, except for the fact that uh, a lot of times I get onto a rabbit trail and end up talking about something that is several steps removed from the Bible. So um, that's where I want to finish this particular live stream is if there's only one book, a lot of you have asked for the one book to read about the Second Amendment. If you're truly legitimately only going to read one book, it should be the Bible. And there's a bunch of um, philosophy and theology books that I would say only read them after you have read the Bible. Um, they will make far more sense to you once you have read scripture and uh, that's a higher priority anyway. So that is something that is extremely, extremely important. Uh, I cannot overstate that. Even though there's a bunch of folks in the chat saying the Second Amendment is not founded on the Bible, uh, obviously those guys missed the beginning of the stream. But the good news is they can go back and watch it. And uh, they can also listen to it on podcast. So uh, I'm, I'm actually really curious to see what the further comments and feedback of this will be. But uh, because this is in fact um, the beginning of 2021, the year when everything goes back to normal and you have plenty of time to read books. Uh, I'm really glad that we were able to get to the T-Rex Arms recommended reading list uh, of stuff that you should know. Starting with the Bible, Second Amendment history, pre-Second Amendment history of weapon rights, human rights, um, the idea that government is limited, why government must be limited, who must limit government. Um, these are tremendously important uh, things for us to understand, uh, even on January 6th, a day in which nothing happened. Uh, according to Google and YouTube, uh, I'm not allowed to talk about anything that has happened, so that must mean that nothing has happened. Uh, yes. 
Constitution is not founded on the Bible either. Um, again, man, go back and read what the people who wrote the Constitution were talking about when they were ratifying it, when they were going over different drafts of it. Um, this is one of the things that I think is an incredibly, um, an incredibly easy to miss point in the modern day and age, because so many of us have been taught that scripture does not apply to all of life. It only applies to the salvation of the soul. It only applies to right inside of here and nothing else. And if that is true, then the idea that the founders were motivated by the Bible when they wrote a document that founds an entire national government, of course it is preposterous. But if the Bible does speak to all of life, then the idea that people who were raised by generations of Christian pastors would have been affected by the Bible in the way that they wrote a document that follows scriptural principles in limiting the government's power and authority, well, yeah, then, then that idea is not crazy. That idea is very logical and hard to argue against. So these are, are very, um, very important things to talk about. And as easy as it is to talk around the tertiary issues, uh, to talk about the internet arguments, um, to talk about what our opponents are doing, I think that we really need to be uh, prepared to go back to the basics because we might be doing a lot of going back to the basics and being in exactly the same positions as a lot of our forefathers were, uh, even though 2021 is the year where everything goes back to normal. Uh, it still might be a good idea to get back to those basics so that we can actually understand what our responsibilities are, what freedom actually is, what our goals and missions are uh, here on this earth, how it is that we actually love our neighbors and protect them. So that's why we're working on the T-Rex Arms reading list. I thank you very much for this kind of early, <laughs> watching me do this sort of early draft of it. Uh, not ahead of schedule, of course, because this was planned for this very day, a day that we knew that nothing would happen. Uh, yes. Don't laugh, Charles. You know it's true. We, we knew that nothing was going to happen today, so we planned a book review <laughs> live instead of anything else. Uh, yes. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Again, all the descriptions of the books that I have talked about are going to be in the video description, or if you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, it's going to be in the show notes. We're going to have a better, sort of more curated list of books with additional books on the T-Rex website at some point, as soon as we figure out where we actually want to put that on the website. And there's going to be additional books being added to it, additional, additional topics related to industry, engineering, economics, and uh, everything kind of related to building nations, building companies, building families, building churches, all the stuff that needs to be built and rebuilt in 2021, the year where everything goes back to normal, um, hopefully we'll, we'll at least touch on in, uh, in, this, in this book list. And uh, yeah, who knows, maybe another live stream. So keep an eye out for that. I honestly haven't got the slightest idea what we might <laughs> talk about next week. Um, but thank you for joining us for another T-Rex talk. Um, sign up for our newsletter because... Even though I have been very careful time and time again to point out to YouTube that I know that nothing has happened today and that I am a good little pro with no revolutionary ideas whatsoever and uh, will not comment on the news or needs of the people around me at all. Uh, we still not be on, may not be on YouTube next week, so go to our website, sign up for our newsletter. That's a better way to communicate with us uh, if we get taken off of social media platforms. Um, oh, by the way, Charles, I got an email from somebody who used to work at Facebook. I asked him how we could be a more valued part of Instagram. And they were like, no, there's no way to be more valued to Instagram. That is not a concept that they have for any of their customers, even giant corporations that pay them millions of dollars in advertising money. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting world that we live in. So, uh, Actually, no, no, this is the year of everything being back to normal. Nothing interesting going on at all. I almost forgot for a second there. Uh, but go to our website, sign up for our newsletter. We will be in touch with you next week about some topic. I'm not sure what it is. I was going to say amen and a women and a children. I actually should have made that joke earlier, Charles. The Second Amendment, the Second Amendment, and not just the Second Amendment. 
but also this second day woman mint and the second day children mint also. Thank you very much for watching you guys. We'll see you next week, somehow or another, talking about something or other. Uh, who knows what could happen in 2021, the year of everything going back to normal and nothing happening at all. Have a great rest of your week. <laughs>